There is now another high-profile opening at the Department of Homeland Security. Secret Service Director Randolph Tex Alice was fired today. This comes a day after President Trump announced the departure of Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen. President Trump can appoint a new permanent director of the Secret Service, but the Senate will have to confirm a new Homeland Security chief, and that's likely to be a drawn-out fight. In their new book, A Hill to Die On, Politico's Jake Sherman and Anna Palmer remind us that it's hard to get pretty much anything done on Capitol Hill these days. The book focused on more than two years of reporting about Congress and the Trump White House, but Anna and Jake have each covered the Hill for almost a decade, and they are here with us on set in New York City. Welcome to you both. It's really great to have you here. Thanks for having uh, us. I was telling you off camera, it was the swampiest book, perhaps, that I've ever read, and we, I mean that in the best possible we way. We were aiming for that. <laughs> um, Let's start with news of the day before we delve into the book. Um, give us a sense of the reaction that you've been getting from lawmakers about the departure of Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen, Anna. Yeah, I don't think it was a big surprise. Uh, clearly, the president has had friction with Nielsen about what is happening on the border, how to proceed. There's been some frustration with her in terms of the inability to stop uh, the, the stem of asylum seekers into the United States. But I do think that a lot of lawmakers saw her as a steady hand, as somebody who was an honest broker, that while they might be frustrated with the policies, they felt like she was reasonable. I do want to say, though, the problems that the president has with immigration, and we touch on this in the book, but the problems that he has is because he is unable to cut a deal with Congress that he wants to stick to. And uh, that is not going to be solved by appointing a more conservative Homeland Security Secretary or getting rid of Nielsen. So it's it's really putting a, a, a Band-Aid on a massive leak, in a sense, to... It's just not, it's not the solution. So I want to talk more about this immigration policy shift that we're expecting here, but we don't have a nominee yet that's been named to replace Nielsen. Nevertheless, what kind of fight, Jake, might we expect to see on Capitol Hill? Massive. I mean, unless the president puts somebody in the secretary job that's already been confirmed, it's going to take up a lot of time. You have to do days of hearings, then you have to have a committee vote and a floor vote. And remember, there's a lot of moderate senators up for election in 2020 who are going to uh, like, for example, Cory Gardner in Colorado, is he going to want, Colorado is a diverse state that's even getting more diverse. Is he going to vote for a Homeland Security Secretary that wants to close down the southern border and mm -hmm. deport a whole bunch of people? I don't know, but that's going to be a really tough vote. I mean, is there an appetite, Anna, for a move for some sort of tougher immigration deal in Congress right now? I don't, I think Jake and I were talking about this earlier today, actually, I don't think there's any appetite in terms of actually being able to get something done before the 2020 election. Uh, I don't think a lot's going to get done. The Senate has already really moved to just basically confirming judges at this point. Uh, so getting an immigration deal with 2020 in the background is it's pretty uh, unlikely. So uh, let's talk about 2018, because, Anna, in the book, you write about the GOP's decision to focus mm -hmm. on fear when it came to sort of the messaging uh, for the 2018 midterms. You discussed this meeting held by then House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, writing, quote, that morning, he urged the dozens of Republicans gathered to forget the positive messaging on the economy that the GOP had publicly been touting. Instead, he implored them to go sharply negative on the issues that mattered most, safety and the Democrats' efforts to turn America towards socialism, destroy health care, and raise taxes. So why? Why the turn to the negative? I mean, clearly Republicans originally thought that they were going to run on tax reform. They, they made it a central issue for why their rank and file needed to vote in support of this package. It never went off anywhere. The American public doesn't like it. And so I think what you saw was polling that McCarthy and others saw on the Republican side making them very nervous about what was going to happen. And so they felt like fear, and particularly even see the president doing it in the, right now in this kind of cry about how Democrats are becoming socialists as a way to try to make sure that their base turned out. Yeah, what are the implications here, Jake, for 2020 then, given what we saw take place in 2018? Yeah, I mean, fear is a very... Uh, sharp and, and useful tactic for people looking to win political office, right? I mean, Republicans felt like in 2018 they had to make their opponent so tarnished and so unpalatable that they would win because we know in the first midterm of a president, the president's party usually loses seats, something the president really never got his head wrapped around. So uh, I assume that we'll see that in 2020 if 
almost definitely the Democratic candidate is going to, at least for some period of the race, be more popular than Donald Trump, not for the whole race, but perhaps for part of it. And the president is most likely going to look to tarnish that person, too. Um, I want to take a step back for a moment. For sure. viewers who might not be so familiar with the swamp and how it operates, can you just talk about your access, how it was you were able to report some of these things? Because clearly there were some very sensitive negotiations at various points that you report on in the book. Um, Anna, can you just sort of spell out what kind of access did you have to lawmakers and to the president himself. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is one of the key things for this book is that we have been embedded on Capitol Hill for years. So we know members of Congress as people, not that they were friends, we're going out to dinner or anything, but there's a real long-term relationship and a sense of trust in the sense that they know we're doing our job and we know what their job is. And just in the sense of the Capitol itself, there are places actually where just lawmakers and just reporters can go. So you really get a sense of being able to talk to them. And in the White House, we, we talked to a lot of staff. We sat down with the president actually and had an extended conversation. And he was pretty forthcoming with how he viewed Congress and where he thought they would be able to work together and where they wouldn't. What surprised you, Jake, when you sat down with the president that maybe you weren't <laughs> expecting to hear? You know, I... And I, we don't write about this in the book, but you do. The president is an engaging guy. Uh, that's why he's been successful in life, because he knows how to deal. That's not the only reason he's been successful, but I imagine that's one of the reasons he's been mm -hmm. successful, because he has great interpersonal skills and he's uh, engaging and charming and that he was a salesman for most of his life. So that's what salesmen do. And and he's very interested in the in policy particulars, which sounds Strange, because in public, it doesn't seem that it, at times that he has a grasp of the policy, but he's very cognizant of what he's doing. And I don't think he does anything kind of in a slapdash manner, in a mm -hmm. sense. I think everything he does has a political reason behind it. Um, so interpersonal sort of politics are fascinating here, too. You discussed this dynamic between President Trump, now House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, yeah. and Chuck Schumer. Tell us about the origins of that, Anna, because we've all remembered seeing them sitting in the Oval Office. We all remember yeah. Nancy Pelosi saying to the president, don't characterize the power, the strength that I bring, you know, as the leader. There it is. That's that video where I think we all, the newsroom sort of stopped when this uh, yeah, meeting took place. She points her finger at she the president. She points her right? finger. Yep. But what's the dynamic? They actually traveled in the same circles. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the things that was very interesting is clearly the president has no problem popping off on Twitter mm -hmm. and coming up with different snarky nicknames for people in his own party. But when it comes to Nancy Pelosi, there's a real reverence and respect. Uh, we asked him about his how he viewed her, and you know, he, she, he said she deserves to be the speaker. He said, I'm going to help her. I will help her get the votes if need be. And so I think one of the things that he really respects about her is, one, her ability to kind of stay hard and true, even when it's unpopular, she stays the test of time, uh, and two, how well her ranks follow her. I think that's one of the things he says in the book to us is, you know, Democrats are lousy politicians, but, uh, you know, he th was very pra praising of how they are able to stick together to the to the end. And what about Chuck Schumer, Jake? Tell us about that history between the president and Chuck Schumer. Yeah, the, the president uh, raised money for Chuck Schumer not too long ago. We're not even talking about 20 years ago. We're right. talking about in the last... 10 to 15 years. Which he and, brought up in front of a room full of other Republicans. Yeah, right. And has brought it up many times, to be <laughs> right, fair, is right. that he, he says he was one of his earliest donors, which is not true, and one of his biggest donors, which is also not true. But uh, listen, they both kind of grew up as people in this city in New York and traveled to Democratic circles. I mean, the president hosted a fundraiser for Chuck Schumer's Democratic Senatorial Committee at Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> so, it's like your brain just wants to explode. Yeah, and if you think about it, and this is something we kind of allude to in the book, but who would would President Trump have more uh, things in common with? Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, two East Coast bred uh, Democratic politicians, or Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan from the Midwest, where Donald Trump has spent no time. Well, when you put it that way, Jake. <laughs> yes. Um, so, Jake, following the midterm elections, President Trump told you he was not upset about the Republican Party losing control of the House. Can you explain that? He welcomed a new Democratic majority. How did he feel then, and how does he feel now with the Democrats in power? In the well, House? I think, I don't know how he feels now, but he yeah. shouldn't feel great just based on what we see publicly, which is Democrats are probing every part of his life and every part of his personal life is business life. I mean, this is a, a really uh, big examination of x-ray of the soul, as I think is what you say about campaigns, and this is close to that. The president said before the, uh, right after the midterms, before Democrats officially took over, that he would be able to cut deals with them. He thought Republicans were too particular in legislating. They had too many changes they wanted all the time. And he was, he seemed sick of that dynamic. And he said to us something like, now I could just say, Democrats, bring me what you want to bring me, and I'll take a look at it and see if I want to sign it. Of course, that doesn't comport with reality as we know it just based on basic legislative principles and kind of middle school civics, but 
uh, it, it shows that he really didn't fully expect what was coming his way. Uh, last question is for the both of you. Who do you think is the most powerful person <laughs> in Washington? And I'm going to start with you. I, I think by far Nancy Pelosi. She clearly uh, stood up to the president with the shutdown and and he backed down. And I think she is going to be the person who's driving the agenda. If the president wants to get anything done on his agenda, whether it's health care, which he's just most recently brought up uh, in a long, you know, long shot bid to get something done there, he is going to have to lock arms with Nancy Pelosi. And she clearly uh, has very you know, strong control of her chamber at this point. All right, Jake, what do you think? I think it's Pelosi, but I think we shouldn't discount Trump. And I'm only saying that now because Anna said the same answer that I had. So. <laughs> no, but listen, the president still has a role, right? He still has the veto pen. He still could sign bills into law. I would think he would say so. Yeah, yeah. and, and we remember what Bill Clinton said after he lost the House. The Constitution makes me relevant. The Constitution makes Donald Trump relevant because he does have the power to put things in law. But he's already talking to Nancy Pelosi about potential deals. We don't expect much of that, but still important to keep an eye on. So fascinating to watch. Jake Sherman and Anna Palmer, great to have you both here. Thank Please you. come back Appreciate anytime. It. Thank Thanks. you.